session section that is just wonderful because it talks about the blood of Jesus Christ and I believe as I know you do with all my heart if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ being spilled on that old rugged cross folks none of us would be here today we would all be doing our own thing somewhere else living in sin as I heard one pastor call it one time, just wallowing in sin. And that's where we would be. And because of this section that talks about the wonderful blood of Jesus Christ and that amazing blood of Jesus Christ, I've entitled our message this morning, The Wonderful Working Power of the Blood. And that's kind of why we sung those songs about the blood. I want to start out by saying this. Jesus Christ did not come to this earth just to teach moral principles now yes he did come and he taught moral principles yes he did but if that would have been his ultimate goal if that would have been his only purpose then I believe that with all my heart that Jesus would have came to this earth and established some Christian university or some university about morals and principles Jesus did not come to this earth just to heal people of their sicknesses now yes he did he came and, and, he, and he healed many of their sicknesses. You go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and I, I, I've told this story before, but it bears to be told again. I remember reading a story of D.L. Moody. And when D.L. Moody was first given the assignment to preach a funeral, he, he was very nervous and he thought, well, what do I say? What do I do? He said, well, I've always throughout my life taken my example from Jesus Christ. So I'm going to go to the Bible, I'm going to go to the Gospels, and I'm going to see what Jesus did at those funerals. He said, well, the problem with that was, he said, every time Jesus got near a funeral, the dead person rose from, from the dead. He said, so I couldn't use that. So he said, I had to go on. But had Jesus come just to heal the sick, he would have opened a hospital, wouldn't he not? But see, that wasn't his purpose, to teach moral principles, to heal the sick, and, and to alleviate suffering was not his purpose. Here's what his purpose was, beloved. His purpose was to come to this earth, die on the cross, shed his blood for you and for me. And I need to say with all of my heart that you will not enter heaven unless the blood of Jesus Christ has been applied to your heart. It is applied there to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That is what this few verses is talking about. Now I'm going to ask you to please open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. And let's stand together. It's our custom here at Grace Baptist as we read the scripture to stand. So Ephesians chapter 2, look down at verse 11. Paul the Apostle is writing to this church and it says, he says this, Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised by the so-called circumcised, which is performed in the flesh by the human hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope without God, in the world but here's verse 13 but now in Christ Jesus you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ let's pray father we thank you for the blood of Christ that was shed on that old Roman cross father first we say we're sorry that it had to happen but we were sinful people. We were wicked people. And you had to provide the way. You had to bridge the gap. And you did it with that Roman cross. So Father, thank you. Thank you for the day that each of us accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Whether it was just a few minutes ago, a year ago, or 50, 60, 70 years ago, Father, thank you. For those that do not know you, Father God, I pray that they hear this message and, and that they don't hear me, but they hear the blood of Jesus Christ. And they accept you as their Lord and Savior, and they will be brought near because of the blood of Christ. 
Lead us and guide us, Father God, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning we're going to look at two things about the blood of Jesus Christ. And here's number one. Number one is this. The blood of Jesus has the power to restore your broken relationship with God. Do you believe that? I pray you do. Disciples, listen. Our text says, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ has restored our broken relationship. And I want you to notice a couple things about sin. First of all, here's the most important thing. Sin alienates us from God. Sin alienates us. From our text, Paul says that this is who we used to be. It's not a very pretty picture. He mentions five things that, are, that describes our lives before we become a Christian. And I want to say this morning, if you're not a Christian, these five things describes your life right now. now. I don't know if you want to use A, A, one, two, first, second, whatever you want to do it, but here's how I have it. This is the first one he, that I believe he says is this. He says that you are separated from God because of sin. You're separated from him. The Bible says that our sin has caused the separation between us and God. And in the beginning, God created Adam and Eve. And they had a wonderful, perfect fellowship and a wonderful, perfect relationship with God. There was no separation. They spent time with him. I love the passage over in 3rd Genesis, the 3rd chapter of Genesis, where it tells us that God would come into the Garden of Eden. And in the cool of the evening, he would walk with Adam and Eve. That's just amazing to me. I cannot fathom that. As much as I try to think about that, of what it would be like, I just cannot get my mind around that. So I have a hard time imagining what it would be like to have that time where you literally walk with God. Because the Bible tells us that God is not man, but somehow his presence and his glory was there with him. It says that man has not looked upon God, but here Adam and Eve walked with God in a very close personal relationship and, and, and fellowship. I don't know what they talked about, but I know that they had a wonderful time together. But all that changed when Adam and Eve sinned. That beautiful friendship, that beautiful relationship, that beautiful fellowship that they had now is suddenly separated. It's separated. And until you and I come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that describes our fellowship. That describes our relationship with him. We're separated from him. The next thing that Paul uses is this word. He says in verse 12, he says, you are excluded. He said, you were at the, that time separated from, from Christ, excluded from the covenants of promise. And until we become a Christian, we, we are excluded. We're excluded from God's paradise. We're excluded from God's heaven. You know, none of us today like to be excluded. We hear people talking, and this one got invited to this party or that party or whatever, or this event, and we think to ourselves, wow, I didn't. I didn't get an invitation to go there. Was I excluded? And then we start thinking, well, why was I excluded? What did I do wrong? What did I say wrong? Who did I make mad? We do not like to be excluded. I wanted to share a story of a personal nature. I'm excluded. I'm excluded from Scott Air Force Base over in Illinois. Now, I served in the Air Force. You know, I did my time with them. But I did not retire from the Air Force, so I'm excluded. I could go over to Scott Air Force Base right now. Now, if I went with somebody that retired and they had the proper credentials, they could bring me in. But if I just drove over there myself and went up to the guard gate and said, hey, you know what, guys, I used to serve in the Air Force, and, you know, here's my little thing that says I'm a veteran and I was in the Air Force never at Scott but you know I've always wanted to come into Scott and look around they're going to go no no you're not but you don't understand I served in the Air Force I was an enlisted guy just like you 
lived in the dorms just like you, ate at the chow hall just like you. They don't call them chow halls anymore. They call them dining facilities. That age is me. And they would probably look at me and say, well, we appreciate your service for our country and that you wore the uniform of the Air Force, but uh, you are not coming on this base. You are excluded from this place. And that might make me sad for a little bit. We do not like to be excluded, but as bad as that can be, to be excluded from paradise, to be excluded from heaven, that is a picture, that is a description that I wish and pray nobody will face. To be excluded from heaven. It would be a tragedy. Paul then uses the word in our text. He says, you're strangers. Now, some translations uses the word foreigners. My Bible says strangers, and it says strangers to the covenants and of the, the covenants of the promise. The Bible says until we are Christians, you are a stranger. You are a foreigner in the kingdom of God. You do not belong. And what's even sadder is that you have that sense of knowing you don't belong. And that is how we were before Jesus Christ was Lord and Savior, if you're a Christian this morning. And then in verse 12, of all of them, if that's not bad enough, those aren't bad enough. In verse 12, he says, and having no hope. Having no hope. Paul says it's bad enough to be separated. It's bad enough to be a stranger. But you do not have any hope of doing anything about it. We cannot do anything about it ourselves. Amen? Can't do a thing about it. All of us know what it means to be miserable or to be unhappy and to suffer. And those are all bad enough. But have you ever been around somebody that's suffering and dying or, or whatever, and there just seems that they do not have any hope whatsoever? It just seems like it makes matters worse, doesn't it? If, you have, if you're in the hospital, if you're around somebody in the hospital, and, and they have a glimmer of hope, there's something to hold on to. Not too long ago, a, a real good friend of ours, Terry Michael, passed away. And we were there with his wife when he passed away. And I remember just a little bit before, she, she and I were standing there along with her daughter. And she looked at the doctor and she said, I just want to know this one thing. She said, is there any hope? Is there any hope? And I looked at the doctor and she swallowed hard. And she... Her eyes went directly to the floor. She wouldn't look Jackie in the eyes. She looked directly at the floor and she said, Ma'am, there is no hope. Now what she was talking about was no hope for recovery. And now to some of us, Jackie might have done what we would consider a little weird at this time. But instead of falling apart, instead of a crying out of emotions and all like that, Jackie looked at that doctor and she said, Terry has hope in God. And there is hope. She said on the other side. And the doctor looked at her and she said, what do you want us to do? And she said, remove everything from him. And let him go be with him. Let him go be with his God and his Savior. And I thought, wow, what a testimony. So here we are. Before we accept Jesus Christ, or where some people are today, they're separated from God, they're excluded, they're strangers, they're foreigners. They have no hope whatsoever. But then to bring it on down, it's almost like Paul starts at this level and he's bringing it on down. And, you know, I think Paul the Apostle is kind of like so many of us. It's just like he's almost thinking, you know, it's time to cut to the chase. All right? He looks at him and he says, you are without God. Those five phrases describes a person who...
who is not a Christian. They describe your life and my life before we became a Christian. The reason we were excluded, the reason why we were separated, the reason a non-Christian doesn't have any hope is because they do not have God. According to the text, it says that God was far off, far away. Verse 13, it says, But now in Christ Jesus, you, were, you who were firmly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Number two, Jesus Jesus' blood restores our access to God. Don't you like that? I love that. That's what the Bible says. To those who are separated and excluded from God because of Jesus' blood, we do not have to be that way. When we've been brought near to the blood by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Bible says over in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19, Therefore, brothers... Since we have confidence to enter the, whole, the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us, though the curtain that is the body. Now we know from our studies about the Holy of Holies in the temple there in Jerusalem. There was a separation and it was a separation between the Holy of Holies and the holy place. Amen? We've all studied that by this thick, large curtain that had golden, gold threads woven through it. And it was so thick that mankind could possibly not rip it. And when Jesus died on that cross of Calvary, it was ripped, not from the bottom to the top. Did you ever read that in your scriptures? But it was written from the top down. That proves that it had to come from God. God was saying, whoever will may come in. We used to be separated. We used to be excluded. We used to be strangers. We used to be without hope. We used to be without God. But it doesn't have to be that way. Come on in. I love you. I accept you. I welcome you. You do not have to be rejected because of your sins. I don't think there's anyone who, at one time or another, has felt the pain of rejection. And let's face it, rejection and hurt, nobody likes. Nobody likes to experience it, but it happens. The second thing I want you to see about the blood of Jesus is this. The blood of Jesus has the power to remove stain of our sin. How do you like that? Ladies, have you ever had a a blouse or your husband's shirt or your kids' clothes and it had that stain and you bought everything that you could think of that's been advertised on TV to take away stain and it's just still there? No matter what the, the, the ad guys say, that stain is still right there in that blouse or that shirt and it just doesn't go away. Well, folks, the Bible tells us that we have a stain. It's called sin. And we can try to do all kinds of good things. We can be nice to our neighbors. We can be good to our kids. We, we, we can even stop kicking the dog and throwing the cat across the room when the wife's not looking. And, and, and you know, we, we can do all kinds of great things. We can be in church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. We can give all of our finances to the church. But if we have not accepted Jesus Christ, that stain of sin is still right there. And the only thing that will remove it is the blood of Jesus. The Bible says, though your sins were, has been as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. There's an old song that we sing even to this day that asks the question, what can wash away my sins? And I love that song because it gives us the answer. It asks the question, but then it gives the answer. What can wash away my sins, God? As if somebody's crying out to him. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's all. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, John the Apostle, John the Beloved tells us, he says, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now here's the great part. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses some of our sins. Is that right? Is that right? Cleanses some of our sins? Oh, gotcha. It does, 
It doesn't cleanse some of our sins. The Bible says that it cleanses all. Say that with me. All of our sins. That's what the blood of Jesus does. It cleanses all of our sins. Now, quickly, I want to share with you three or two statements about the blood that cleanses us from sins. And I want to make these statements, and then I want to tell you a story to illustrate them. First, the blood of Jesus is shed in your, on your heart and covers your sins, and there is a complete cleansing of your sins penalty. You are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and also the penalty of sin is completely washed away and for all. Isn't that great? I would classify that as good news. We heard earlier that Aaron, who shared with Romania about what went on with Romania, she saw nothing good. Everything was pretty blah, pretty black and white. Not a whole lot of white, just a lot of black, which is, you know, in her eyes, it was just bad that was going on. We'll see the blood of Jesus Christ. We have a lot of black in us, and that black is related to sin. Amen? And that blood of Jesus, that precious blood of Jesus, washes all that away completely. And just like when she went to Romania and, she, and her eyes were open of the goodness and what was going on with those people and those kids in that orphanage and how, how thankful they were, we can do the same thing. And we can have our eyes, our eyes opened. Second, there is also a continuing cleansing from sin's power. Let me ask you a question. Now think carefully. Think of the day that you accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, whenever that may be. From that time to this moment, have you sinned? If you have not sinned, you just sinned. If you said, well, Brother Bruce, I haven't sinned, you just did. Guilty. Because we all have. We're human. The Bible teaches that salvation to the soul is like a bath to the body. It begins the cleansing. And when we come to Jesus Christ, we put our faith in him and his blood washes us and, and we're clean and the penalty of sin is absolutely washed away. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What is the sin's penalty for those who have never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior? Separation from God in a place. And let me say this, and I say it without compromising, without being ashamed. There is a place called hell because my Bible speaks of it. My Bible speaks of it. And there is that place. And without Jesus Christ, if you die in your sins and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, my dear friend, you will spend all eternity in that place called hell. And don't give me that line where you'll say, well, me and my buddies will be there and we'll have a rip-roaring good time. No, you won't. That's the sin and the penalty of sin, separation from God. And when you as a sinner or I as a sinner, when we came to Jesus Christ and said, Lord, I believe in you. I believe what the Bible says about you. I trust in you. I ask that you forgive me of my sins. He does, and his blood cleanses us once for all. And that sin's penalty is taken away from us. It's washed away, gone, forever. And that's why we believe that once you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you've done it with all sincerity of heart, that you are saved and you do not lose that salvation. It's there for all eternity. Now you might say to me, well, Pastor Bruce or Pastor Valley and Brother Bruce, you know, I, I still sin. Yes, you do. So do I. Believe it or not, I'm sorry, not perfect. I do sin. Well, what happens when we as Christians go to 1 John? 1 John 1, 9. You probably can all quote it from memory. When I was in the Air Force and part of the Bible study, we read this scripture, 1 John 1, 9, and we were not taking light of it. I want to say that off right at the very beginning. We talked about it as being Christian men and women and then sinning, and we were lovingly, truthfully referred to 1 John 1, 9 as Christian bar soap. Because it's what's good. First John 1 John 1.9 says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
If I'm a Christian and I sin, I can go to him. I don't ask him to save me again, do I? No. I just say, Lord, I've sinned. I blew it. I let Valley take over and he did what was right for him and not thinking of other people. I have sinned. God, forgive me of my sins. Not save me again. That's already happened way back. Forgive me of my sins. And my Bible tells me that God will do that. And I'm cleansed. And I'm cleansed. And some of us, many of us, need to do that every day, don't we? <laughs> we need to do that every day. God, I'm sorry I blew it. I let the old nature take control. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Once you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that old, nation, old man nature does not leave you. It's still there. It's just laying right under the skin, and it is just waiting to come out. And that's why we got to keep that, that line of communications between us and God open and ask him to forgive us of our sins. Well, let me leave you with this story. Now, this is what the part of the story that illustrates this. Heard a, an account some years ago about a physician who was doing his residency in an inner city hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. And he was working in the emergency room, and one evening they, they brought in, the ambulance brought in a young 16, 17-year-old boy who had been critically injured in a car wreck. And as they began to cut away his clothes, it was obvious that he was a wealthy young man because the, the doctor said that there wasn't too many teens in that area that were wearing Rolex watches or designer clothes. And the medical team was doing everything that they could to, to save this young boy's life. But his injuries were so massive that, that it was beyond help. The boy's parents, the mom and dad, were summoned to the ER room, and the doctor told them of the condition of the son, and they brought him in. They brought the parents in. Now, later on, the, the doctor learned that the parents were separated and had been separated for a couple years, not divorced, but separated. And it was not a nice separation. You've heard of those, those nice separations. Well, we just separated nicely. These two literally hated each other. They had not spoken to one another for a couple years, and whenever they talked to their son, the dad would tear down the mom, and the mom would tear down the dad, and it was just a constant. And here these two people are, face to face over the body of their only son, hoping that he would survive. As I said, the doctors did everything they could, but they could not save the boy's life. But, but before the boy went on, and before he passed away, and he had the oxygen mask on trying to breathe, he reached up and took his dad's hand, and he reached up and took his mom's hand. And he brought them together and laid them on his chest. And then within just moments, he passed away. The doctor said later on he found out that mom and dad did have reconciliation and they got back together. And as I thought about that story, I thought, you know, that is exactly what Jesus did for you and I. We were alienated from God because of sin. He loved us dearly. But see, we didn't like him. Because we felt that if we, we became Christians, we were going to have to give up our fun. That we couldn't do X, Y, and Z or 1, 2, 5. And life would just be boring. And so we didn't like him. We were separated from him. And imagine, if you will, in your mind's eye, okay? And I'm not, of course, you know me, I'm not being disrespectful at all of what our Lord and Savior did on that cross. But imagine, if you will, he took your hand and God's brought them together and laid them on his chest at that cross and then he breathed his last then he breathed his last but unlike the young man Jesus rose from the grave he arose from the grave he walked around on this old earth and he encouraged his disciples and talked to them and explained things to them a little bit further 
And then he ascended into heaven, and the Bible tells me that he is seated at the right hand of Almighty God, and there he sits, and he does that to intercede for you and I. And I believe that with all my heart, when we understand how much God loved us, to do that for you, to do it for me, it's impossible for us to walk away from that kind of love. That precious love of Jesus Christ. Him shedding that precious, sinless, spotless blood for you and I. And that's what it does for us. That's what it is either already done for you, if you're a Christian, or that's what it can do and will do for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. For those of us, Father, that have accepted you as Lord and Savior, Paul to this church there at Ephesus tells us that this was what we were like before but we're not now. But if we don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he's describing your life the way it is right now for you. But it doesn't have to be that way. You were far off. You were strangers. You were excluded. You were, you, you were away from God. But because of that blood of Jesus Christ and that blood of Jesus Christ calling out to you and, and beckoning you to come, you can be near to him because of that precious blood of Jesus flowing on old Calvary's cross. Father God, I pray that you speak to hearts. And, and not only just for hearts that accepts Christ as Lord and Savior, maybe there's folks that have already accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, but they've wandered far off on their own. That you will use this message, Father God, to draw them back to you of walking faithfully with you once more. Father God, you have your will and your way in our lives. Speak to our hearts now, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to please stand. Hi. Thank you for watching Channel 798. Thank you for watching Channel 798. Hi, thank you very much for watching Channel 798.